Well, turn to James chapter 2. I'm going to continue our um, sermon message, because it really wasn't via sermon, but our series, but um, we started last week talking a little bit about speaking like a king. And we went through scriptures talking about, you know, uh, walking by faith the way God walks by faith. And uh, then we looked how God walks by faith, Isaiah 55. And then we went over to Genesis chapter 1. And we went to he- Hebrews chapter 11. And we just found that that the way God walked by faith was that he spoke things into existence. We talked about how kings, it's how kings do it. Kings don't, if kings need a ditch dug, uh, they're not out there thinking, they're, they're, their process of isn't, where, where did I put the shovel? Their process is, we need a ditch dug out there. They speak it, and their servants, those that at, at their at access, goes and gets it, uh, gets it done. But we have angels, you know, we, we have things. Uh, but the point is, is that we are kings and priests. We are a royal generation and uh, a royal priesthood. So the thing we got to understand here is that God wants us to operate by faith the same way he does, the same way a king does, and we got to speak it. And we spoke uh, uh, last week, and I think it's been coming up here periodically, is that our problem isn't necessarily that we don't understand the word, but it's an identity problem. I'd almost, you know, that'd be a good sermon, an identity crisis in the church, as we've forgotten we're kings and, we're kings and priests, and we're, we're uh, acting like, according to Romans, mere men. And we need to make sure that we understand who we are so we can operating the, start operating the way we're operating. Now, this is just where we started last week in James chapter 2, verse 17. It says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee thy faith by my works. You believe that there's one God? Good job. <laughs> the devils do too. And it drives them to action. I like that. Uh, that. That, you know, because they believe, they do something. And they tremble. If we really believe God and believe uh, believe in God, we need to be excited and we need to be excited to put seed into, into the harvest because we know it's going to come to pass. He says, verse 20, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. And so if, if we, if just because we know things, I think I said this last week that um, your faith test doesn't come because you could uh, get a sheet of paper and fill out what faith is. Or that you could get a hundred on a, on, a, on a test that Pastor Thad formulated on a sheet of paper. And you go, yep, that's faith. Yep, that's faith. Yep, that's faith. That's how faith would work. That's not how you pass the faith, faith test. You pass the faith test by what you do. Um, I, I, I love... Over in Joshua, go to Joshua one eight, John. I'll I'll let you turn for me. Um, but I love the makeup of this because uh, again, it doesn't say it, it doesn't end with meditating and speaking. He says, "The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night." So keep it in your mouth and keep thinking about it. Keep meditating on it, like chewing it like a cud, like the the cow's cud. And, 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 and bring it up, chew on a little bit, swallow, chew on a little bit, swallow, that thou mayest observe to do. See, that's it. Notice this. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate there a night that. So, I mean, I, I, actually, it would be as accurate to say, so that you. The reason we meditate, the reason we, we speak it is so that we. Can do it. If you're not doing it, if you're not doing the word and you're not speaking the word and you're not meditating on it, there's nothing going to happen. But if you will observe to do all that is written therein, then <laughs> you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. But I like, I like that word. I've just never really seen that one word. So that you. 
Beloved, we, everyone in this room, I, I, I could say what's one of the main keys of, of walking by faith, and everybody in this room would go, the words of your mouth. The question is, what you doing? Uh, Monday, Jessica and I were on the way home from work, and uh, some of the things that happened at Jessica's work were, uh, were not what was fair or right. And it irrit- irritates me. Uh, when things don't, when, when, in my job or with people here, if, if Jessica sees people mistreat me, it makes her madder than it makes me. Not that anybody here has done that, but, uh, but that's the way it is with me when, when, I, when she comes home and she says, this person did this, this person did this. And it made me mad. And so I just jumped right in there. It's not fair. It's not right. They need to do this. They need to do that. And you know what? Every word that I spoke was accurate. Um, I, I, we could tell you guys the story. You go, yep, that was accurate. The next morning, I dropped Jessica off at work, and, and uh, um, I was just about out and about my day. I think I'd gotten started heading over to Lexington and just was listening to some scripture. And the Lord, the Lord gently and kindly, reminded me of my sermon on Sunday. I said, now, now remind me again why your words were created. I said, for creating. So they weren't, they weren't created for complaining and for, and for uh, 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 conversing or communicating your feelings. I'm like, no. And he goes, let me, let, me, let me play back a little bit. This is not exactly how, but this is, this is how it felt. Let me play back a few moments of your conversation with your wife yesterday and let me know what you were doing. Part of me was like, you could have kept this to yourself. I don't, no. But I sat there and I was like, oh. and so I text Jessica and I said, well, here's, here's what the Lord just told me. And I don't think I even said it about her. I just said it about me. And then she goes, yeah, I know. I think I was there too. And, but I said, we didn't create anything with our lips last, yeah, last night. We were communicating our feelings. And we were wrong. And, we, and, and, and I said I was wrong and I, I need to... to to repent. <laughs> but but isn't that some? That you can get the message and it can be a living. And, and again, my revelation on this, again, all I've done is, the only thing I've looked down here at is is James chapter 2, reading in that. Other than that, this has just been something that the Holy Spirit is revealing to us. He's showing it to us. He's placed it on my heart. And yet sometimes it's the hardest thing in the world to do is to actually put it into work. To put it into action. If you're not doing it, it ain't going to work for you. Amen? And so that's one of the reasons I think that I stopped just short last week of finishing my message and then all week long in my private time. As a matter of fact, I don't know if anybody all week long really dealt strongly just straight with the words of your mouth, which surprised me because you thought somebody would have, but amen, maybe God's saying... Y'all should already have that by now. Uh, <laughs> um, let's go over real quick. Let's just start in Psalm 141. Uh, this is kind of where we left off, and uh, I won't give you the same illustrations. If you want some really good illustrations on this stuff, uh, I, you, la- last week there was a good uh, SNL skit reference that that uh, I, I almost wanted to preach. I just wanted to usurp what God told me to do on Tuesday just to preach this sermon so that I could give that SNL illustration of cheeseburgers. As all I wanted to do is, it, because I thought, that's just too good for everybody not to hear it. But I didn't. Um, and then, and then uh, a World War II illustration. And it's still my favorite thing. I can't get rid of it. Shame on you, blabbermouth. Amen. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll, 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 we won't focus on those too much. But in Psalm 141, verse 3, it says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Uh, the, NAS, the NASB says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Message translation, post a guard at my mouth. Now, I kind of believe that when he keeps saying here, post a guard, 
I believe the Holy Spirit's a guard. And His Word is a guard. So when you're talking... All right. Um, the Spanish dictionary... And, and, and just understand how I'm saying this. Would be a guard if I was speaking to Spanish-speaking people. And if the words that I was speaking to them was not in the Spanish dictionary, then I'd realize I need to change the words. I, I know that sounds weird because you wouldn't be sitting there going, I wonder if that's in there. But, but if, if, my, if my words, when I'm speaking to them, is not in the Spanish dictionary, then, then the communication is not right. And so it tells us in Psalm 103 that the angels respond to the word. And so if my words don't line up with the word of God, then there's, no, there's a communication breakdown in heaven. In the same way, as I've, if I was speaking to Spanish people, there would be a communication breakdown if all I was doing was using these words. I would have to use their words, I'd have to use theirs, their dictionary in order to communicate. And, and that's the same way it is in, uh, with, with, with the words of your mouth. If it's not in the Word of God, or it doesn't, it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you shouldn't be speaking it. That's the first thing. I think that's a guard. And I believe the Holy Spirit, because have you ever been talking? It took me about a day, probably 12 hours, to hear the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but have you ever been talking and you know inside of you that what you're saying you shouldn't be saying? Amen. And... Uh, For you, sir. <laughs> you, knew, you knew it wasn't what you were supposed to be saying. And maybe you just kept along. It's, it's, it'd be kind of like, you know, when people are robbing banks. They don't, go, they don't walk in with their, their plans right before the guards. You know, looking out and going, you know, in big, big letters, uh, disarm alarm system. No, they're very quiet, very sneaky about that because they know if the guard catches them, the guard will say, you shouldn't be doing that. So when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts you. And, and so when you are uh, when, when you're trying, when you're speaking something you shouldn't be speaking, and 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 it's and it's causing chaos in your life, you need to be receptive to what the Holy Spirit's saying. Because when He says, "It's enough of that," you shouldn't be doing that. It, it, it keeps you from going into word jail or whatever. Does that make sense? So, so we need to pray that God, we need to give God the access to set up guards in our lives. Um, because what comes out of our mouth will either produce life or will produce death. All right, go to uh, Proverbs 13. Hallelujah. Loose lips. That's right. So we need to keep our keep a guard on our lips. Uh, Proverbs chapter thirteen verse three says, "He that keepeth," and you know you know my definition of that word "keepeth" is is to keep it like your life depends on it, and that's that's really the message here. He that keepeth his mouth like his life depends on it keeps his life, but he that opens wide his lips will have destruction. Um, the uh, uh, NIV says, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. So when you just let whatever you feel, I, I feel like this person has wronged me. Boo! It, 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 you are creating ruin in your life. Whether you want it or not, that doesn't matter. Um, 
Have you ever been in, I'm trying to think of a, a specific situation. Well, um, is anybody here want mold in their house? Anybody just try to? Yeah. Has anybody ever had mold in their house? Po- probably, possibly. It's just because there was some moisture that was getting in that you didn't really know it was getting in. But whether you knew it or not, whether you wanted it or not, if the, if the climate was correct, guess what pro- was produced? And so you may not want uh, ruin. You may not want destruction going on in your life. But if, you're, if you are creating the environment around you with your words, you've ha- I was going to say you don't have a say, but you've had your say. Your say is what got you in the, pro- in the problem in the first place. Amen. So again, these are just saying that we've got to watch the words of our mouth. Careless talk costs lives. Shame on you, blabbermouth. Now go over to uh, Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark eleven twenty-two. We'll get into some that that was as the kind of stuff that we finished on last week, and I just wanted to kind of get a running start. And and I thought it was very impressive that I didn't go through everything. I just did a really, that's one of the quickest rundowns I've ever had. <laughs> but in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, we know it says, And Jesus answered and said, and then this is regarding the fig tree, have faith in God or have God kind of faith. And then he says, here's how God's faith works. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say... Unto this mountain be thou removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He will have whatsoever he saith. So again, if you want to create or dissolve things, you know, there's some things in our lives that need some dissolving, isn't there? Some things in our society that need some dissolving. Well, if we're, if we're going to see them dissolved or created, then it's going to come because of what we say. And I've, I've seen, you know, too many people. I, I was listening a couple weeks ago to Keith Moore, and, and he had this guy come to him and had, uh, had just a very serious problem when he came to him. And, and uh, so he said, yeah, I'll pray for him. And he said he prayed, and he said he felt the anointing there. And and he just he fully anticipated. I mean, he thought, he thought, oh, I know that I know that answer's there. I know. And uh, a week later, they came back, and the guy said that. Well, let me put it this way: it, the situation had didn't get cleared up at all. And uh, and Keith Moore, you know, he's just kind of meditating on it, and and and. and some, it's like the Lord told him to stop at one point right, right near the guy, not talking with him, and he just over, overheard his conversation. And, and the conversation was just going, you know, uh, and, and just like, I don't know why it's not working. I don't know why things aren't working. It just keeps getting worse, keeps getting worse. I don't know. Uh, it's just, it just doesn't seem to be working. God doesn't seem to be. And, and, and the Lord spoke to him and said, you understand? You understand why it's not cleared up? It's not because the, the the prayer wasn't anointed. It wasn't because something didn't happen there. It's just because that he 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 ruined it all. He 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 uh, stopped it all from manifesting because of the words of his mouth. A, a, a great prayer, a power anointed prayer, can be undo, undone moments later simply by the words of your mouth. James chapter one verse twenty six says. If any man among you seems religious, and, and it, it, it just means that he seems to be doing everything on the, uh, correct on the outside. You know, maybe, maybe they, they've got the right haircut, and the right clothing, and, and maybe they have the right religious lingo. Maybe they go to church. Maybe during praise and worship, they actually praise and worship. Or at least go through the actions. They have all the outside. That's religion. That's what religious. That's what it's talking about. On the outside, everything looks right. But if he bridleth not his tongue, he's deceiving himself. 
Christians will be like, oh, the favor of God, the favor of God. I believe, uh, yes, I like what Pastor says. I'm a child of God, therefore I get to receive the favor of God, uh, the favor of God, the favor of God. And they get real excited about the favor of God. And they walk out, out of the church service and they're like, why didn't anything ever good happen for me? It seems like, it seems like you know, I, I go from one battle to another battle, nothing. I don't see any answers. I have not gotten any harvest off of anything, and 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 they 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 seem like they got it all together, and and that, that's why faith doesn't come by knowing something; it comes by doing. It's come by hearing, currently hearing, keep it active in your life. But he says he deceives himself, and that man's all of his actions is just actions. It's empty. He's not going to walk in what God said he could walk in. And beloved, that's why the church world is the way it is, it is in the shape it's in today, is because we're all this actions. And see, here's the, here's the goofy part, is now churches are going, let's not do all the actions and just, just believe God. You can't do that either. Because if, cause if all you're doing is, be, if, you believe, if you truly believe in God, He'll change your actions. All right. Go to. Let's see where we go. Go to Romans ten. Uh, you may think so. I don't even know if I want to go. Go to Luke six, not Romans ten. I'll just I'll, I'll make reference to Romans ten. You may think so. If something's said enough, so so Pastor, that I just need to say something enough. Um. You know, I need to keep guard in my mouth, make sure I try not to say other things, and just and if I say this enough, and then that's I, I I put this in here is that beloved, you can never. <laughs> you ready for this? You can't say something enough to make it happen. How many times do I have to say it? See, you're already on the wrong. You're you're you're. It's uh, Luke. Go ahead and go go to Luke here real quick here because uh, Luke six forty five I believe it is. A good man, out of the good treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. Here, here here's here's the thing. It's from the abundance of the heart that makes a difference. So, it, Pastor Lisa could say something one time and get manifestation. Whereas the person next to her, on, on her right side, I'll tell you before Megan gets back in, so it's not. The person on, on next to her says something 1,300 times and doesn't get anything. The difference is what's inside. Now, I, I was going to have you turn here, but I'm not going to, for time's sake, I'm not going to. But Romans chapter 10 talks about the fact that there, there's a lot of saying that is changing what's on the inside of you. In the process, the, the reason Jesus was able to say things like be healed or curse the fig tree one time and it, got, and it happened was because of all the other times his words remained the same. And so there may be a lot of words on your lips that is adjusting your heart. You, you with me on that? Uh, and again, you can look this up later, but in Romans chapter 10, 8 through 10, it, it, it describes that, is that the words of your mouth begin reformatting inside. It's rebooting what's inside of you. So that you can get to that same point that it's not a, you could say something 1,500 times and never have it really change because, again, what James says is that you got that murky stuff that keeps keep slipping in. Every now and then you speak your feelings. Sila, amen. And, and so because every now and then it, it pollutes it, and so you're saying something 1,600 times and nothing's really changing inside because... Again, uh, James 3, don't have to turn there, 
But James 3, 10 through 12 talks about that you can't have salt water and pure water or bitter water and pure water and expect it to be, it to be pure. It's still going to be uh, bacteria infested, germ infested, because of the little bit of bitter water that you put in there. But if you just continue to speak what God says and what God's Word, and you keep that guard and don't let anything else in, if you just continue to do that, it begins, it'll continue to water and cleanse and push out all the impurities until all you're left is the purity of the Word of God that is there to change you and transform you. So we're not, this is not, listen, one of the things that, that, that the Lord spoke to me, and I think I mentioned to it ago, is this area where we treat faith like a recipe. A little bit of the words of your mouth, a little bit of action, uh, a little bit of joy, a little bit of praise and worship. Uh, you know, and we, we, we say if we just get all these kind of things together, something's going to happen. That's not what it is. It's not a recipe. And that's why a lot of people, I think, mess up is because, again, all right, all right. Um, if, if, if I'm making, all right, I, I'm going to use biscuits. I don't know how, exactly how much biscuit, you know, this, but, but I remember when I, I made biscuits at Arby's, I was a biscuit extraordinaire maker. I was, it was, they were good. But you mixed Self-rising flour with um, Crisco and buttermilk. And they'll write them out, and then you just you'd mix it, and you'd get it in there, and then you'd get it on the table, and you'd knead it and all that kind of thing. You'd roll it out, and then you'd pop them in there. It is extraordinary. Um, but now let's say i am got this big bowl, and I, I put the flour in there. I put the Crisco in there. I put the buttermilk in there, and then I start working it around. And uh, I think, you know, I got, I'm, I'm drinking a, a Mountain Dew over here. And I'm getting ready to drink it. And I, I'm not paying attention. I just pour half the Mountain Dew bottle in there. Maybe it'd be great. I don't know. I don't know if it'd be good or not. Um, but see, I've just contaminated that. And, and I, can't, I can't add more. Uh, more flour, and I can't add more. And, and see, that's how we start treating this, is that, is that if I just do a little of this, a little of this, a little of this, you're not taking into mind throwing something in there that's not supposed to be in there. Uh, I, I had a late, there, there's a story, there's an account of Papa Hagen where the Lord told him, and you guys probably know this better than I have, I've just kind of heard it secondhand, where the Lord told him to say certain thing read a certain scripture like a thousand times every day or something like that. And, and, uh, and so he did. Now, God told him to do that because God knew what he needed to do to get the breakthrough in that situation. So he did it. And he got breakthrough in that situation. Well, there was a lady that was in, in my ministry when I was down in Texas, and, and she got this idea. She said, that's what I need to do. It worked for Pastor Hagen. It'll work for me. You know what? She never did see the breakthrough in that area. Because she was trying to work a recipe that was created for someone else. And she was not, it was not meant for her. All right. Long story short is that we need to, we got to make sure that we understand that the words of our mouth isn't this little thing that we need to add every now and then. It's got to be our lifestyle. Because when we abuse it, we are, we are weakening, uh, we are weakening the, the, the words of power that God has given us, but we've also are creating things in our lives that need not be, it said, destruction. Amen. All right. All right, let, let's, let's, um, uh, uh, let's hit this real quick. Mark 5. I, I, I'll finish this thought, but then I want to kind of, oh, goodness, I forgot that I had that. That's okay. I'll get on to that part. But just to finish this point up, in Mark 5, verse 28, talking about the lady with the issue of blood. And we've made this point before. That's why I don't need to spend a lot of time here. But in verse 28, 
it says, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Now, why? Now, that first of all, for she said is in the Greek actually means she said and kept saying she didn't say anything else. She just kept saying, man, if I can just touch his clothes. That's what drove her. That's what kept her moving. Um, but why, why, why did she say it and keep saying it? Why did she not say other things? I don't think I'm ever going to be able to touch his clothes. I don't think I'll ever get there. I don't, I don't know if this will work or not. But no, it's because deep in here, she had settled it in her heart. That if I could touch his clothes, there is no way in the world I'm not going to be healed. Because I know his power, I know his anointing, I know his track record. And so once she made that up in here, nothing else came out here. If, if, If a little bit here and there, again, it wasn't because she was like, oh, oh, Pastor Thad told me I need to watch the words of her mouth, so I'm going to really try my best. No, she was absolutely convinced from her innermost being. Whatever she had been doing beforehand, even if it was listening and hearing the reports of what Jesus did to other people, even if that was all she did, she was convinced. See, we get convinced that, well, I know too many people that it didn't quite work that way with. And that becomes our area of convincing and so inside, we got this little area of pollution. And we need to get in the Word and get that area out so that it's not a magic trick to keep the same right words on our mouth constantly. You know, she said it, she kept saying it, and what happened when she touched the hem of his garment? Yeah. Go to uh, Joshua chapter 6. Hallelujah. I don't, it seems like I've been preaching on this guy a lot, even this week. Um, but, but there's se- several things that popped up to me this week. Um, that just that really struck me strong. But I, want you to, I just want you to see a couple things in regard to this um, as we start wrapping up. Well, huh, all right. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just, I'm going to actually, Joshua 6. And, then, and let's, let's, I want you to look back here at the beginning. Um, verse 2. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho. Which is really goofy because Jericho was shut up and ready for war. <laughs> and, and God goes, look, look, I've given thine hand into Jericho. Nothing in the visible showed that. It's just that what God had done in the past. And the king thereof and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall encompass the city, circle the city, all the men of war go around the city once, and that you shall do for six days. The seven priests shall bear before them ark, uh, the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horn, and the seventh day you shall encompass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Now notice this. This is what God is telling Joshua. And the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of... uh, uh, Verse 5, I'm sorry. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet... Now who's God speaking to here? Joshua. Not to the group. not Not to the millions of people. To one man. He's getting instructions. And the people shall shout with a great shout, and the walls of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend every man straight before him. All right, so now notice this. God says, here's the way we're going to do it. You're going to walk it one time around the walls for six days. On the seventh day, you're going to go around the wall seven times. And at the, after the end of the seventh time, there will be a blast of the trumpets, blow the trumpets in Zion. And when the, when the trumpets are blown, the people will shout, and God says to Joshua, I will make the walls fall down flat. All right? So Joshua goes, and he said, verse 7, he said to the people, pass on and encompass the city. 
and let him that is armed pass on before the ark. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing ram's horns passed on before the Lord, blew the trumpet, and the ark of the covenant followed them. All right, verse 10. Let me get down to verse 10. And Joshua had, had commanded the people. Now, here's, here's the thing. I've said this because I, it, it was interesting what, Paul, uh, what Joshua had left out or what, what he added, but he also left something out. And I thought this was so interesting. I, I preached on a little bit on, I uh, closed my message with it on, on Tuesday. But he said, you shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth on the day that I bid you to shout. And then you shall shout. What did he not add there? That the walls would come tumbling down. He, it doesn't even seem like in that part, he even gives them the hint of that God's given them the city. God spoke to him, gave him details. He spoke to the people. The main key was we're walking around and you've got to be quiet because I don't want anybody saying anything that's going to get out, of, get out of whack. I don't want any impurities mixed in with the faith that's getting ready to go here. But after that seventh time, when you hear the ram's horn, I want you all to shout when I tell you to shout. Nothing else is said about what's going to go on. I, I, find, I, I just found that intriguing. You go on down there to verse 16. And it came to pass at the, on, this, on the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said, here's what he said to the people. Now again, God told Joshua what was going to happen. And there is no... There is no picture here that, uh, that, you know, on day four, as they walked around the fourth time, somebody noticed a crack in the foundation. And they said, hey, some, see that? That wasn't there yesterday. There's no hint that day seven, uh, on the fifth time around, that, that, that there was a rumbling going on. They're going, what's going on around here? It seems to me that as they completed the last, the, la the seventh time on that seventh day, that nothing had changed at all. It would have been so easy to say, well, what do we do now? That didn't work. Nothing happened. Not that we've ever done anything like that. But when they got that seventh time around, the trumpets blew and then Joshua proclaimed something. What did he say? Shout, for the Lord has given us this city. He knew what was about ready to happen, according to God. The people still were just saying, all right, we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to do, that you may observe to do. We're going to do what we've been told to do. They still didn't know how. They didn't know what. They just knew the word of the Lord came, and we're going to celebrate the word of the Lord. So the first thing they've said in seven days is to shout, because God has given them the city. And it wasn't until they shouted, it wasn't until it came out of their mouth, and it wasn't until they loosed it that the walls came crumbling down. What was going on that seven days? Stuff. Heaven's forces were setting, setting TNT, spiritual TNT uh, in, in the walls. Spirits, is it C4? Is that what it's called? Explosives? They were putting it all around, spiritual, along the baseline. And nobody knew it. Nobody saw it happening. But when, when, when listen... First thing that's been spoken in seven days is shout for the Lord has given. First thing that was spoken in seven days is shout for the Lord has given us this city. He didn't know how it was going to work. He knew what it was going to happen. He didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't know what in the world was going to happen. But the first thing spoke in seven days.
Hallelujah. I said, how many times have we ever read that and just never really caught that nothing was said about falling? Go to Daniel 3. We know this. We've talked about this. But I, I, I still want, to, I want you to see this. Because your words are either creating blessings or, or ruin. Because that's the power of your words. You got to choose which way it's going to go, and don't think you can. Don't think that your vain words. Again, Matthew twelve, I think it is, where it says you'll give an account of your vain words in the day of of, of crisis. When it's not working, you're going it didn't work. No, it's worked exactly right because you've created ruin. Daniel three verse fifteen. There's just a couple here things I want to say here left, and how there's several actually, but I'm skipping some because these are things the Holy Spirit was just in in putting into me this week. Verse 15. Now, if you be ready, now again, uh, I'm going to use that word. Uh, the tattletales came out uh, and and told on uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I. Boy, if that doesn't tell, talk about the time we're living in, I don't know what does. Because they told on him, hey, did you know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego aren't bowing? They're not. So he calls them in and he says, okay, now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, it's always our favorite word, psaltery and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the image that I've made, good, uh, good, we're going to let things slide. But if you worship not, um, you shall be cast that same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, there's, there's a deception that this king is, is deceived, and he says, how can any God deliver you from that if I'm going to throw you in there? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, King, weren't, I love this answer. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. And, uh, and again, if you just look at this, uh, when you understand what careful means, it means full of care. They're like, man, we're not worried about how we answer you. We're, there's nothing in us that is even worried about this. We're not worried that what we're saying may not come to pass. In other words, we're going to declare what we know. We're going to declare what is true, and you're going to watch it come to pass. There's, not, there's, no, care, there's no care in this statement. So he says, if it be so, if you throw us... And this is the really the important part. They're answering getting thrown in the fiery furnace. If you do throw us in the fiery furnace, our God, whom we serve, now listen, I love this, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and will. Beloved, if your God is able, if you can get it in your mouth, you can believe that he will do. Our God's a healer. Then get it in your mouth. My God prospers me. Then get it in your mouth. Quit allowing the enemy to bring lies and bring deception in you. He loves the deception. Don't uh, James one twenty six. Don't turn there. But remember, he said you look like you got it going on, but you you haven't figured out the words of your mouth. You're deceived. There's deception going on. And so they said, my God is able, and he will. He w say he will. Say it like this. Say, my God will deliver me from the fire. He, he, my God, say it, has already made a way out of the fire. My God is a great big fire extinguisher, so I have nothing to fear. <laughs> now, we've all been at some level deceived by verse 18. Because we think verse 18 goes into verse, from verse 17, but actually it is point B. In other words, they said, if you'll, if you'll bow down. 
you're good. But if you don't, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. So their answer is, if you throw me in the fiery furnace, uh, that, that's, they're referring to the second part, God will deliver me. If you don't, you know, if you choose not to throw us in the fiery furnace, they were not, they were not, I've, I mean, I've preached it that way, that, that they were going, they're going, but if our God doesn't deliver us, no. They'd already declared what they were expecting and what was going to happen. If we go in there, our God's going to deliver us. How? They didn't know. Would God quench the fire? Would God, what would he do? I don't know what he'd do. I just know he'll deliver us. I've heard people bring this up that, you know what, even if they were to die, God delivered them. What kind of sense does that make? What kind of sense does that make? I have it written here. Our God is able to deliver us, and we may have to die for him to deliver us. That, that, no, that, what kind of testimony is that? Because the king just declared... How's your God going to deliver you from this? Well, he's going to, you're going to kill me, and then we're going to go to uh, Abraham's bosom and wait. Uh, no, that's not. See, what would he care? You're you're, you're out of there. You're out of his hair. <laughs> All right, I, I gotta I gotta just move here, but. But if you don't throw us in the fiery furnace, let it be known we're still not going to bow. You can show mercy to us, but it's not the kind of mercy that my God has shown us. We will stand for Him and not for you. Now, let me let me insert this here, right here. The uh, the scripture over there. If John wants to turn there, that's fine. Uh, you, you guys can just write it out in Matthew sixteen nineteen, where he says, "I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom." And he said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Young's literal, which again, remember the literal, the Young's literal means they're not trying to make it sound real fluent. They just want you, they want us, they're going to translate it the way it's to be translated. Young's literal says it like this. And I will give to thee the keys of the, uh, to key, the, keys of the reign of heaven. All right. So how, how to operate in heaven's system. Whatever thou mayest bind upon earth <laughs> shall be having been bound in heaven. So what you bind on earth will already have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be having been loosed. Already in heaven. I know it sounds weird, but that's literal translation. In other, I think one of the great translations of this is the Moffat translation. And it says it like this. I will give you the keys, keys of the realm of heaven. Whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. In other words, we're not getting things to happen in heaven realms. They've already happened. And if you, permi- if you give permission to something happen on earth, heaven will stand behind you. And and heaven of heaven on earth, and it, and then it says, whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So now, when you go back to Daniel, where he said, or, or to, to the three Hebrew children, where they say, our God is able and He will, they just released something on earth. They permitted something on earth. And guess what happened on earth? What happened in heaven? Are you with me here? Our words are the keys to either permitting or prohibiting around us. I want to go to one more here and then I'll wrap it up. Go to Daniel 6. I read this just because I was I was already in Daniel three and I knew Daniel six is is a like is a similar situation. Uh, again, tattletales told on David, and uh, uh, 
uh, he's getting ready to be thrown in the den of lions. He is already set. It doesn't ever say, I like, I like this, Daniel never really says what he's believing. Um, but he, he, he seems very peaceful about the situation. But I want you to notice something. Go to verse 16, Daniel 6, 16. This got my, this got, I just, I thought this was funny. Because a king, again, what does a king do? A king speaks. The king did, the king loved Daniel, right? And he, I am not saying Daniel didn't do it already through his, but the king verbalizes access, permission for heaven to touch earth. Look at that, verse 16. The king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of lions. And the king spoke. The king, he's a heathen king, but he's a king. He spoke. He said, the God that you serve continually, he'll deliver you. I thought, I thought, because I just look, I was looking for something maybe with Daniel. But we don't know Daniel's heart was already set. And I'm not saying that Daniel was, de- was dependent upon the king. But I love the fact that the king, the one who had authority, spoke authority and said, the God that you serve continually will deliver you. But now go down to verse 18, because this got my attention too. Are you ready for this? this? We're closing this thing. The king went to his palace, passed the night fasting, which you know what? I fast every night too. I mean, I, I very rarely eat my sleep. All right. He passed night fasting. Neither was there any instruments of music. So again, it was, it was more than just the sleeping time. It was the time where they were usually getting a little maybe drunk or whatever or, or feasting. Neither were the instruments of music brought before him. And he didn't sleep the whole night. Let me, let me read how I wrote it down here. If the king would have understood the power of his words, he would have slept sweet that night and woke up the next morning knowing that his God was going to deliver him. And the reason I, I closed it with like that is that, beloved, we're kings and priests. We have been given authority to create with our lips. And those sleepless nights because of circumstances that we've already spoken, we've already said, whether it be healing, prosperity, whatever, and then, and then you're tossing and turning, you're not sleeping. Beloved, know who you are. Know what you've already created. Know what you've already put into work. Know that your God is able and He's faithful and He will. Do it. And know when your words have been put to work, you don't need to worry or fret or bring in words of feelings. You don't need to worry and fret and stay up all night fasting. Get up and have a midnight snack. Go ahead. Because when you get the Word of God in your mouth, it is a sure thing. When it becomes you as kings, when it becomes the only thing that comes out of your mouth, it's a sure thing. Whatever you loose, whatever you bind, will get loosed or bound. Because you've lined your words up with, with the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I hope that came through clear. Praise God. Permission from heaven. Let's stand together.
one of the scriptures I didn't really read here, and it's just uh, I wanted to get to the the insights that the Holy Spirit had been giving me all week. In Psalm 40, in the NASB, verse 9, it says, I have, David saying, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I didn't restrain my lips. You know. I have not hidden your righteousness in my heart. I've spoken of your faithfulness, your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from your congregation. What he's saying is that I've not shut up about who you are, what, what you have for me. I've talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. I've talked till people get annoyed at me talking. Verse 11, you, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Beloved, if you will learn the power of talking and just keeping, it's, you know, it's okay if people get annoyed at you. And you don't always have to give them all the details of what you're believing for. But if you will line your words up with what the Word of God says, and you stay faithful to that, and you stay strong in that, and you proclaim that in the, even in the middle of, uh, of what doesn't look like it's going right, shout for He's given us the victory. And, and as He was saying that, the walls were still upright. There were no visible signs of erosion. That didn't matter. Because he had a word. And all that was going to come out of his mouth was that word. He had been wandering for 40 years in that wilderness because of other people's words. And now he was going to change his current situation by getting his words lined up, even if they didn't match what he saw. Shoo. I'm supposed to be stopping. Shout. Heavenly Father, I love you, I love you, I love you. You have been so faithful to us all our life. You've been faithful. All of our life, you've been so, 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 so good. And Father, we, we know that it is your passion, it is your desire for us to walk in victory. To live above and not beneath, to be the head and not the tail. To walk, to walk, uh, <laughs> to walk as, as mighty warriors, to walk victoriously, but here it is, is that none of that can happen if we don't line our words up with your words. If we allow our words to run reckless and rampant, it can't. We must tighten up our lips so that we can manifest all that you have for us. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray for my beloved, those that you have placed in my care as the, as the shepherd, as the under-shepherd. And Father, my greatest desire, I believe, matches your greatest desire. And I know I'm nowhere close to what, where you are. I want to see them prosper and be in health, even as their soul prospers. I want to see them walk above and not beneath. I want to see them be the head and not the tail. I want to see them blessed coming in and going out. I want to see them blessed in the cities, blessed in the fields. I want to see, I want to see their bank accounts blessed, and I want to see their wallets blessed. I want to see them walking in the fullness of life that you said they could have. I want them walking perfect and complete Lacking nothing. But we got to do things the way you said they need to be done. And so we meditate on your word to get it deep in our heart. We speak your word to get it deep in our heart and, and to change the atmosphere around us. And we do it. We do what we're supposed to do. Because heaven is showing up on planet earth. And we're going to walk like heaven on earth right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Lord, correct us, change us. Like what, like, like Jesse and I did this, this week. When we allowed our words to kind of get a little bit away from us, you said, mm, do you remember your message? <laughs> and we corrected it. And, and, uh, I would say for the most part, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday were different than Monday and Tuesday for Jessica. That's the way, that's way you want to work. You want to make our lives perfect. Father, there, there's some jobs in here that are causing some people to be frustrated. Their frustration is not going to change it, but their words will. Give them the words. Give them the things they should speak. So they're creating instead of ruining.